am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Those who believe in me, even though they die, shall live, and those who live and believe in me shall never die. Let us pray. Most gracious Father, on this day, a day we had convinced ourselves might never come, we are gathered nevertheless to honor a remarkable servant of your son, Jesus Christ. So as we honor Midge, we pray above all that we would honor you and give glory to your name. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing, Ferris, Lord Jesus. Please be seated. On behalf of the family and our church, we welcome you to this place. If experience has taught me anything over the years, it is that y'all, the Cransons, know how to remember folks and remember them well and with honor. So, at this time, I will be handing things over to you to share in your remembrances, your thoughts, and your testimonies. Uh, we've got that microphone all set up for you, okay?
Margaret Ann Nita Midge Cranson peacefully passed away June 12, 2020 at home on her farm in La Hunza, Colorado, just days before her 95th birthday. Today is her 95th birthday. Midge maintained her independence, living on her own with support from her children. Her prayer was to live out her life at home. That prayer was answered well. She suffered a massive stroke on June 9th and never regained consciousness. With her children's love and care, Midge slipped away peacefully in the same bed where 15 years earlier she had held her sweetheart Walt in her arms as he breathed his last breath. In an interview in May 1993, Midge was asked how she would like to be remembered. She replied that I loved and served God, that I loved and respected my family, and they loved and respected me, that I loved and helped care for my fellow men, and that I enjoyed and appreciated life. What you're going to hear now is a little bit of a recounting of how she accomplished all those things. Okay. Margaret Ann was born June 30th, 1925, to Albert and Otilla Odie, we called her, Kruger, in Burr, Nebraska, in Oto County, the third of four children, two older brothers and a sister. The Kruger family made their living farming. They lived through the Depression and Dust Bowl, relying on strong work ethic and faith in God. Over the years, Mid shared many memories of a happy childhood. Beginning in 1934, as grade school children, Midge and her siblings made a name for themselves in the area, performing for several years as the Kruger Kids Tumbling Act at area, pic area community picnics and village celebrations, such as the J July 4th celebration in Syracuse, her hometown. Midge and sister Janetta developed a tap and acrobatic routine. Midge did, did tricks riding bareback on her horse. There's a clipping from a 19, uh, excuse me, August 1937 local paper which showed Midge and Junie, ages 12 and 10, respectively, in ornate matching outfits made by their mom where they entertained at a Syracuse beauty pageant. Midge earned a teaching certificate. And after high school, she started teaching. Okay. After high school, thank you, all right. She earned a teaching certificate after high school started teaching at a small grade school that was near her home. Three years later, after attending the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, she met Army Lieutenant Air Force Pilot, I'm sorry, Air Force Pilot Lieutenant Walter N. Cranton, who was stationed there until he deployed to England. After World War II, Midge and Walt were married on September 16, 1945, in Syracuse, Nebraska. They took up residence in La Hunta, Colorado, where Walt worked briefly for his father at Cranston's Golden Rule Dairy. In 1946, the year their first son was born, and before they owned a car, Midge and Walt purchased a small airplane, a Piper Super Cruiser. Over the years, the family often flew to Nebraska, landing on 
on the farm where Mitch grew up and her parents lived. Eventually, Walt taught Mitch to fly. After earning her pilot's license, Mitch occasionally flew solo to Nebraska for visits with her family. Mitch and Walt were members of the Colorado Flying Farmers Association. In 1957, Midge was named Colorado's Flying Farmer Queen. The entire family, including all nine children, traveled by train to Chicago, Illinois, where Midge was honored in the Queen competition at the National Flying Farmers Convention. I want to add, they said she probably would have been given the National Queen Honors, but they figured with nine kids, she just couldn't fulfill the duties that involved traveling around, so. In 1952, Walt and Midge purchased a farm east of Lahaina, where they raised their children and lived till their deaths. Midge focused on being a wife and mother. Ever busy with family and the farm, she made time to volunteer and serve at the Fort Bend school PTA in church and in the community. Midge helped orchestrate fun events for her family and friends, including creating parade floats, hosting farm hay rides and river bottom cookouts. She, Walt, and their nine children, Cranston Consolidated, celebrated many unique family traditions. Among these, raucous family viewings of old eight millimeter family movies, and the joyous Thanksgiving week filled a family pilgrimage to the farm. They often took family trips, especially camping in the mountains and visiting relatives in Nebraska. The Cranston family were Presbyterians and the growing family fully participated in the life of the church. Midge actively served in the church as an elder, taught Sunday school for many age groups, sang in the choir, played handbells, and served on many church committees, both locally and denominationally. She helped establish the Stephen Ministries program at the church. It was her joy to help serve home communion until early 2020. After all her children were in school, Mitch began working as a clerk in the Santa Fe Railroad. Not being a paper and pencil person, Midge moved into people-focused programs. Her entry into social service programs began as a result of the government, government's 1964 War on Poverty. After receiving training at Kansas State University, she worked as a migrant program social worker, focusing on child development and the challenges of poverty. She helped establish daycare centers for migrant workers by her children, sorry, and later became a Head Start teacher. In 1967, she became the planning director for the Otero Bent Crowley County Parent Child Centers. She was executive director of this tri-county program from 1968 to 1972. In 1974, Mitch helped develop SAGE Nutrition Program a private, nonprofit corporation which provides meals, transportation, and other services for the elderly in six rural Southeast Colorado counties. She retired from this rewarding job in 1994, having been its executive director for 20 years. At her retirement party, Midge received many cards and well wishes from family and friends as well as from federal and state officials with whom she had worked, including a personal letter from Colorado's First Lady, B. Romer. While running the SAGE Nutrition Program, Midge was appointed to and served on several state and local governmental agencies, commissions, and task forces, and received recognition for her contributions. She was appointed in 1977 by Governor Richard Lamb to serve on the OJC Advisory Council, serving 12 years, 10 as its president. In 1984, she was recognized by Governor Lamb as State Volunteer of the Year. 
She expressed that these were jobs that I enjoyed, felt challenged by, and knew that I was being of service to others. And may I add a separate comment like my brother did, and they didn't think she could do it all with nine kids. <laughs> In addition, Mitch worked for years with the original steering group to organize the Arkansas Valley Hospice where she ultimately became involved in direct patient care. She helped organize and deliver meals for the homebound for 26 years with Jay's Christmas, community Christmas dinners. She avidly supported Inspiration Field, an organization providing services to individuals with developmental disabilities and served on their board for 15 years. Everyone there, enjoyed her creative Halloween costumes. She and the family were members of the La Hunta Community Concert Association. She served many years on the board and was an enthusiastic and effective membership salesperson. She was a founding member of the local Toastmasters group, owning her skills and earning numerous awards as a communicator. I don't know of any obituary, it takes five people to read. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to be good at this. Connections were always important to Mitch. She treasured her family and dear friends. In one of her yearly Christmas letters, she wrote, Our relationships to family and friends is, indeed, a great gift that gives quality to life and makes me feel blessed. Midge especially loved Thanksgiving and the gathering of her children and their children and their children. Until 2017, this gathering was held at the farm. Though the growing, friend, through the, though the growing family filled her home to overflowing, grandkids enjoyed sleeping shoulder to shoulder on Grandma Midge's living room floor. It was truly a time of giving thanks. Gratitude abounded. God is good. Over the years, she expanded her knowledge of health, nutrition, and health-promoting products. Mitch willingly shared her knowledge with others. She partially credited her longevity to her attention to health, acknowledging God's goodness and grace and all her blessings. Mitch kept her mind active with the daily sadhuku. Is that the way you say it? I don't do it. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> Crossword puzzles. I've done a few. Uh, Mitch faithfully sent birthday cards to her children. Her children, 34 grandchildren, 75 great grandchildren, and their spouses. During her last year, Mitch asked, added a special personal touch in each card. Poem she wrote just for that person. Recently, her grandchildren shared how special she made them feel, each knowing they, they were grandma's, Grandma Midge's favorite. I got one of those poems in May. Midge was preceded in death by Walt, her husband of almost 60 years, sons Garth and Danny, daughter. Uh, Annie, daughter Babette Tully, Babette's husband Stephen, and grandchildren Lavender Cranston and Samuel Knightley. She is survived by her children Gary, Sue, Lahanta, Jan, Leroy, Bukowski, and Lahara, Nate, and Kathy, and Lahanta, Anna, and Jerry, Warsaw, and Lima, or Lima, New York, Greg, Addie, and Peonia, and Randy. Hunter and 34 grandchildren and 75 great-grandchildren and her lifetime BFF sister, Janetta, Janetta Copenhagen, Haber, Nebraska City, Nebraska, and numerous nieces and nephews. <clears throat> Midge truly loved the Lord and spent her life in loving service to family and community. She was dearly loved and will be greatly missed.
pause now for an organ meditation on the Lord's Prayer and then continue with our remembrances. Remembrances of Midge could easily take a very long time. Uh, nevertheless, we will do what we can in the space we have. I invite you to come forward if you would. Um, and it's a difficult microphone. I realize you have to get as close to it as you can. But for the benefit of those uh, of your family who are watching, um, if you would do that, that would certainly help them. So um, come on forward. church about two years ago. She was one of the first people we met at the Presbyterian Church the first time we attended. She was so warm and inviting and instantly made a bond with my daughter Lacey, who is now five years old. We quickly learned we were neighbors and lived just east of Midge on Highway 194. Lacey loved seeing Midge on Saturday morning, Sunday morning, and often sat next to her. We drove by Midge's house every day. Lacey would always say, Hi, Midge, as we passed her home. She was such a lovely person, and she's missed by the Book family. Our love and prayers, David Book. And I'll do one more from an email. This is from Darlene Durbany. Midge was the real deal. She was sincere and totally sweet. Her smile, <clears throat> pardon me, 
Her smile was warm and her touch, touch was gentle. I vis visited Midge's church for a special program. I sat alone. Midge left her seat, walked to me, and invited me to please sit with her. Her invitation seemed authentic to me. It seems like a tiny nothing, but it was a big thing to me. Thank you, Midge. And come up when you're ready. Try not to touch. absolute honor it was to have Midge as a grandma and I know I speak for, I speak for many of us here and particularly for um, my sister Joanna and my brother Tom who are joining us over video from uh, Rochester, New York with their families as well. Um, just hearing through the obituary and I know through many of the remembrances that we're all going to share the, the values that grandma had and the way that she was such an example to us I just wanted to acknowledge and say what an honor that was and how I see so many of her priorities and values really just impacting the decisions that I make in my life, and um, I appreciate that. But I um, actually have a memory. <laughs> I'm gonna try to get through really quickly here. Um, I have a memory that I'm reading on behalf of my sister, Joanna. Um, she says, I loved connecting with grandma after I became a mom and watching her show interest in my boys. Two summers ago, I decided to fly from New York to Colorado with my three-year-old son knowing it might be our last chance to visit grandma, and it was. One day, despite her painful knees, she asked if she could walk Daniel back to look at the cows behind her barn. The minutes stretched on, and after about 30 or 45 minutes, I started to grow concerned that grandma had fallen, couldn't walk back, or something had happened, so I headed out to look for them. As I rounded the corner of the barn, I found grandma in her sun visor, just sitting with a stick in her hand while my son happily bossed her around, creating a construction site together in the dirt. I love the way she took time to make every family member feel so special. I'm Genevieve. I am the daughter of Annette and Jerry and one of the oldest grandkids. I don't know that I'm proud of that anymore, but <laughs> it's the truth. <laughs> Our grandma, Mitch Granson, made each of us feel uniquely loved and individually known. Which was quite a feat considering the size of her family and how far away our particular family lives. She somehow managed to celebrate each important moment with us and had an amazing way of making each of us feel special, seen and loved by her. Every birthday she would send a card this year's cards, as one of my uncles already mentioned, had personal messages in the form of a poem, which I thought was pretty impressive, especially given the amount of cards she had to send out. <laughs> she outdid herself with loving us all. In fact, my birthday card came two days before she passed away, and a voicemail was still on my phone, fresh from her to listen to, which I'm so grateful for. This speaks so much to her diligence. It's your birthday today, Grandma. Today you'll be 95, surrounded by love. You've been and still are. You've just reached now your final home, your reward. I celebrate you. I celebrate your life today, Grandma. You lived your life full of stuff that mattered. Family, friends, work at church, and the community. You lived intentionally, but with a grace and ease that displayed how the work came straight from your heart. 
You impacted us all with your free gifts of kindness, grace, wisdom, love, and faithfulness. Grandma, yours was a model I hoped and seek to follow. When I visit, we'd have porch time and healthy food time and rest time and time at a community breakfast and time with family and then memory sharing time and then we repeat that. And somehow she always made me feel like her world revolved around me and I know that's the same for all, every single one of us. I don't know how she did it, but the effect was powerful. I believe that Grandma displayed the kind of priorities that are heaven's priorities. She loved her family, her community, her church, her Lord. And in turn, she was by many of us, many people adored. And that's my nod to a Ryan grandma. <laughs> Lord and adored. <laughs> and the verse that I think of when I think of her, one of the many is in Colossians. It says, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer everyone. Grandma, the pen doesn't have enough ink to write down all the ways you influence and shape my life and the life of those that you loved. I'm proud. I'm proud to be your granddaughter. I'm grateful. I'm grateful to have had your wise influence in my life. I'm grieving. I'm grieving that your time here is finished. And I'm relieved. I'm relieved to still hear your gentle voice in my heart, full of love and grace. And I'm waiting. I'm waiting to meet you again soon. I love you with all my heart, Grandma, and I thank God for you. And in the words of Proverbs, the woman of valor's children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren rise up and call you blessed. years in the making. This woman we're here to honor today, so I consider it well worth the time, well worth the taking. To express these words I'd like to say, and I'll start off by musing on these words that I'm using, just wondering if they'll do the job right. For easy it ain't this picture to paint of a life that's so full of light. How can words ensnare all the love that is there, or capture the kindness of heart. They take a verbal tale the size of a whale, and that'd be just the start. Speaking of starts, that's where you begin to let me back up and commence once again. On a little piece of Nebraska land, for that's the real start of Margaret Ann. One of four to hatch, the third in this batch to complete her rural degree, which taught her the role and educated her soul in the ways it needed to be. So when she met the young gent, this second lieutenant, with an offer to begin a new life, she took the tools in her heart to make a new start and move west to be his good wife. So with each other in arm, they bought him a farm and worked until they were shown how the cane and kids they grew, they finally knew that's what made this place a home. This bond that would form would become the norm and glue the family together. There's no denial, no matter the trial. Every one of them they could weather. For together they'd stay and in this way be stronger than any one alone. Because the knots that were tied, yes, they've been tried. But they've lasted and oh how they've grown. Just look at us here, come from far and near. With only one thing in mind, there's nothing we'd rather than come here and gather to honor this woman sublime. Well, I can speak for days of the countless ways she's blessed. All those who are found to be within her reach, to share, not to preach, and impart Christ's love all around. Dispersed where she goes, this love that she knows has been spread through her words and her touch. We've all seen it or felt it. It's like she can't help it. And the lessons we've learned are so much. If we look to the past, we see what at last, this legacy we've all come to know. 95 years in the making, 
and it won't be shaken, and still it continues to grow. thought they'd be cool to wear and so we put them on and we wore them down to the river bottom and we were on horses and goofing around and I I lost one along the way the one that I was wearing and I came back and I was so I don't know just kind of heartbroken <laughs> and I didn't want to face grandma because I knew she would not be very happy to know about it and so I told her about it and she was like oh that was a really special piece that came from somewhere special but she was really forgiving. And then that same time we were here, my dad had a, a class reunion. And I went to the class reunion and they had soda there. I didn't drink pop very much. So I saved an extra one for the road and I put it on top of the car. So I think it was locked and at the end of the day, I'm holding it and it was like grandma's new car. I'm holding it in the car and it just, I didn't really touch it or anything as far as I know, nothing special, but it just, it just shot right out the top of that can and just went all over <laughs> her new car. And I was, I came home and my dad helped me clean out the inside of the car. And I was really, uh, again, I was just really touched by how forgiving grandma was. And I really felt like I was more important than her stuff, even the nice stuff. And another time, we were, we were in Paonia, and the guys were hauling hay. I was just young. And so I went along, and they paid me a few bucks to roll some bales into a row so they could pick them up with the baler, or the hauler, whatever you call it. <laughs> I'm not a farmer. I'm sorry. <laughs> and afterwards, I came back to the house, and Grandma was like, Dove, I heard you worked really hard today. She said, come over here. And she had me sit on her lap. And she just said, tell me all about it. And she really wanted to just listen to that. And I don't know, I don't know. I think everybody's kind of saying that. I don't know how she made us all feel so special. How did she have enough bandwidth to do that? Even with just nine kids. I don't even know how you do that with nine kids to make each one of them feel special. And then what was it, 34 grandkids? How did she do that? And then our spouses too? And then 75 great grandkids? And now some great greats? And that's incredible. I, I really, I don't know, and my wife Holly said that, like I just felt so special to grandma. And I don't know how she had enough love to make each and every single one of us feel so special. And I don't, she's, she, I'm sure she sent more 
birthday cards in a year than I've sent in my entire life. And each one was, it meant something really cool. It was always, one time I got one and it was postmarked from Paonia. And she had, you know, known, oh, I'm gonna be in Paonia, so in order to get this to Dove right on his birthday, I gotta send it from Paonia. If it was me, I would have like, oh no, I'm in Paonia, I gotta go scramble and buy a card. And she had it all planned out, she knew exactly, and she cared about each one of us so much. And so, um, I just, I, Grandma, I hope you feel just as special as you made all of us feel because you are one of the most special ladies I've ever known. And I'm so grateful to have her for a grandma. And I appreciate it in that saying, her prayers continue. I feel like her prayers have been one of the greatest strength in my life, to influence my life and bless my life. And just that thought of her prayers continue to affect us. Her life continues to affect us. And and just looking out here, it's like, this is just a testimony to this amazing woman. And I hope that all of us continue to stay connected. I feel like that grandma would really be blessed and honored by that. And just, I know she always loved seeing, seeing us cousins goof around and wreak havoc all over the place and make noise and messes and that brought so much joy to her. I think even today as we hang out and just love each other and appreciate each other and try to learn each other's names again or whatever it is. <laughs> that I think I think grandma's just root that just brings a smile to her face and just really I think it's important. I hope we still get together for Thanksgiving and whatever that is. Keep keep on her. Yeah, thank you, Grandma. I, I just thank you, God, for this amazing woman. I just so beyond what we deserve, so incredible, her influence and touch. Thank you, God. Thank you for touching my life. Thank you that I could be included in this fold, in this group. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Law is a little different than being one of their children because she wasn't averse to giving me direction when I uh, crossed with the, she, she thought she uh, thought I should be doing, especially with my kids. Uh, I, I'm pretty conservative. I had a little talk with Grandma, and she's always put other people before herself. And I appreciate that with her. Um, but I think I had a little discussion about people working hard and, and earning what, what they get. And I think it got a little heated. And finally, I, I said, well, teach me to argue with a stubborn German. <laughs> um, but uh, it's a... Uh, It's, I don't know, it's just one of those things where you expect things, like Grandma said she's lasted so long that it will just keep working and keep, keep going on. And so it was kind of a little bit of a shock. But she would, Jan, in the last three months with this epidemic and stuff going on, uh, she'd call her every day. And sometimes Grandma would call over at our house and I, I remember several times I answered the phone and she'd be surprised that I wasn't out doing something. And, and I, I told her, I, I'm having a lazy day today. And she goes, well, I, I've had lazy weeks like that too. <laughs> so, but I appreciate uh, her for the good direction she's given to my wife, who's been a blessing to her children.
awesome to interview her, and uh, she called me after she watched it. <laughs> Should have worn heels. <laughs> Anyway, she called me after she watched it, and, and she said, you know, I watched your movie, Taya, and I didn't understand all of it, because people talk really fast. Um, I'd like to rewatch it, but what I got from it was, uh, I really saw your heart in it, and I'm so proud of you for creating art that shows the heart of God. And then a few weeks later, I got this in the mail, and it says, Sweet Granddaughter Taya, here is a modest gift to support your filmmaking ventures. You have blessed us all with your efforts. It is only fair that we help support that effort. It is my pleasure to do so. I encourage you to keep using your talents in such a meaningful way. I love you and many blessings, Grandma Mitch. Anyway, I got this little check from her and um, I just, I keep seeing it in my purse and reading it over and over and just feeling her influence that I think will continue to show up throughout my life and I'm just so grateful for that and for who she was. So happy birthday, Grandma. Two, two Sabbaths, I preached about Grandma and uh, shared about her, her life and the part that, that I never could get through, and so I don't know why I'm picking that part to share with you. <laughs> Glutton for punishment, but uh, I'd say that the one of the more powerful experiences I've had in getting to have conversations and things with people and to just hear and learn and, and uh, appreciate the the legacy that she's left with all of us, uh, was walking in. And, and I don't think it felt as real as uh, the whole, you know, her passing and everything didn't, didn't really feel real until I walked into her house. And all of the memories and, uh, started flooding in of so many Thanksgivings and so many, yeah, just so many uh, kick the can adventures and, and food that went all the way down the hall and people laying all over each other and, and sharing gratitude and just walking in and seeing what, you know, what was it that, that grandma made? <laughs> I didn't realize that she had made her life about so many different spheres, but the one that I got to witness and be a part of was just seeing how dedicated she was to family, how important family was to her and how, uh, yeah, the, the birthday cards, the, the, the graduations, the weddings, the vacations, the, you know, there was nothing that, no distance that was too far to travel in order to be with family or, uh, and so walking through her home and seeing that plastered all over the walls, that, that she had surrounded herself and that it was kind of her, her hall of fame or her, her legacy was, was so poignant there as you walk down and you see this is what she surrounded her life with. And literally from the, from the floor boards all the way to the ceiling, just all of the, the weddings, the graduations, the, the anything, the little drawings and whatever was all what she lived for and what she surrounded and what she thought about and what she appreciated. And, and uh, just, uh, Don was talking about the values that she had and how she lived those out. And so just, oh, that nostalgia, that, that, that feeling of just, wow, the, uh, a, a clear picture of what her life was made of. And I, I was standing there 
in the living room and just taking in the, the atmosphere there and I have this, this sense, this overwhelming sense of well done, Grandma. Amen. Well done, Grandma. Yeah. You did it. You, you lived for the most important things. You weren't distracted. You, weren't, you, didn't, you didn't lose your way. You lived for that which was good and purposeful and holy. And uh, yeah, well done. You've, uh, and I think as we go through our lives, I'm starting to think of how I'm living my life, and what legacy I'm leaving, and, and how each one of us want to get to the end and be able to have God say, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in what is least. Now I will put you over great, great things. And uh, so praise God for that testimony that wasn't so much appreciated. Not, she wasn't one to preach at you, but she was one to live the gospel. And to, her actions spoke louder than words. spend a few hours with her and say goodbye and tell her we love her. I'm so very grateful that we were able to do this. Because of these uncertain times, we all agreed it was best to leave our kids at home. My son Henry, who is seven, has a unique personality and bonds almost instantly with anyone he meets. He had a very sweet relationship with Grandma Midge. I asked my children if they wanted me to give Grandma a message. Explaining death to a child can be difficult, especially the loss of someone close, as these losses are, of course, extremely personal. I imagine it to be extremely confusing. I've chosen, in one way I've chosen to explain death to my children is that we have a body, but we are a soul. Our souls simply occupy the body we are in right now. When it is time for our bodies to expire, our souls live on. Henry's message to Grandma, which he said to, to her, was that once she passes, he would love her, he would love for her soul to come back as a teddy bear so she could stay with us always and we could hug her and love her anytime we want. I gave Grandma. I gave Grandma Henry's message and I know she heard. I so wish I could be with you to share memories and tears. Your mom and I always felt close, even when the miles were long. I offer my 
love and support to you all. I love you, Judy. And we love her. Mom did too. They were special, no matter how far apart they were. And my son Eli, who's got the gift. Last week was Father's Day. I had plans to spend the day in the mountains, maybe sit and eat at a restaurant, and social distancing allowed, and just be outside with my daughter, Laylee. Things were a little heavy, though. Laylee seemed to understand why Daddy was sad, and she would say, I miss Great Grandma, too. Her sweet little hugs and words were perfect. As I was searching my room for something, a hat maybe, I forget exactly what, I stumbled across an envelope I had saved. Postage sticker says April 17, 2013. My address was faded, but I could still make out the state Georgia. The return sticker on it, right as can be, said, Mr. Walter N. Cranson, address, La Hunta, Colorado. Please tell me, I'm not the only one who wondered how many of those stickers she had <laughs> go through. I just checked my birthday card from this year. It was a different sticker, of course. She had sent me this package in that letter with a binder full of me. Every playbill from every show I had done. High school shows, community theater shows, even a show she and Grandpa drove to Denver to see me in newspaper articles of or featuring my, me, and of course a birthday card. I remember getting it and thinking how awesome that was of her to keep all of this. It hit me even harder to find it again on Father's Day. Knowing how much I love my daughter made me think of how much Grandma loved nine kids, a gavel of grandchildren, a small nation of great-grandchildren, <laughs> and an ever-growing population of great-greats. It is even more amazing that I know each of us felt like we were her favorite. I love you, Grandma. We will miss you. been one of the most accepting and loving persons I've ever met. She took an interest in each person she encountered, and more than once I heard her refer to how privileged she felt to be allowed to enter into and share the lives of others. As long as I remember, I have felt her love and interest in me and my life. As a kid, I loved being at the Cransons for the fun with the cousins. We sang a lot, and love from Aunt Midge. Her love and interest extended to my husband and then to our girls as well. I am sure Aunt Midge was one of the first to show, Jesus, show me Jesus through her love and actions. I may not have recognized it in my younger years, but as the years went by, her example of his joyous, all-encompassing love has continued to inspire me. She was one of the few who called me by my full name. Beverly sounded like a blessing coming from her. Funny, it seemed most others used my full name only when I was in trouble for something. I'm sure there was quite a reunion and celebration in heaven when she arrived. You will be missed, Aunt Midge. 
Thank you for everything. Ev Feitner Yancey. Granddaughter Christine. I visited with her yesterday and she shared memories of the farm going out there. Uh, grandpa and Grandma always uh, willing to be involved with them and she particularly remembered something none of us have thought about for a long time. White dog and the animal Gabby, the monkey. And how mom tolerated that, none of us know, but <laughs> she did. I have a few thoughts, just remembering mom's uh, openness to new things. She had to be open to it, survive Walt Cranston, the adventurer, the philosopher, and all the things he was. I remember after I got my pilot's license, asked her, I had a little tail dragger that a friend would let me use. We went out flying, buzzing around in the prairies in that little two-seater. She was just having a great time, enjoying the, the earth go by down low. And, uh, she always, always felt like she enjoyed things you were interested in. And, was enthusiastic about your feelings of them. I remember the old four-room farmhouse, probably 25 by 40 maybe, I've never measured it. Nine kids, no indoor plumbing, a spigot for water from a pump in the basement, working, working, working to feed and clothe all of us. I remember this is my, the first time I think I really realized uh, her nature, her love, and her, her, I'll say servant nature, I don't have the right words, but for us, I remember Saturday nights, we had a galvanized tub in the kitchen, which was probably six by eight, we'd heat water on the stove, and Little kids first, and then the bigger kids. And somewhere I think we changed the water in the middle and started over. But after all that, getting us to bed, which wasn't, which was no mean feat because we were rambunctious at bedtime. I remember her out there on her hands and knees with a bucket scrubbing the floors. And it was a farmhouse, and we were not conscious of scraping our feet or boots or whatever. That to me, I've always remembered is that enough said. <laughs> she always had time to help us, homework with nine kids. I learned so much. She taught me how to compose my thoughts when I was writing, help with all the stuff. I didn't, I didn't ever think she was uh, what an awesome school teacher she was, but uh, before that, but I'm thinking back now. And she always had time for bumps and bruises, emotional and physical, that we had. And some esoteric things, memory of, when we first moved out there, there were a line of sheds, and one of them was kind of on skids, and there were rats living under that. And I remember her opening the south window, we had a 22, and <laughs> blinking the rats out the, out the window. I don't remember if she ever got one. <coughs> <laughs> she gave them a run for their money, yeah, for sure. Uh, that's enough, and I'm going to close with another something from Andrea. I have a very sweet memory from when I was probably about 10 or 12, maybe older. My dad, and I think. My brother Eli and sister Amelia drove out to the farm to visit Grandma and Grandpa one evening. I didn't know they were, they didn't know we were coming. No, I'm sorry. I didn't know if they knew we were coming. 
We pulled into the ever familiar long dirt driveway and parked just past the front lawn. The sun was nearly set, so the incandescent light from inside the sliding glass doors made it easy to see into the living room. The TV was turned on, I think PBS, with some band playing something or other. I remember seeing Grandma and Grandpa in each other's arms swaying to the music. I thought it was, I thought it was so sweet and so beautiful. I remember thinking, that is love. That is what I would one day, as the kids would say these days, hashtag goals. <laughs> it's something I've always something I've always thought of in my relationships, and lucky me, I have even found a husband that will dance with me in the living room. I'm forever grateful for this and so many other examples of love and graciousness and kindness that Grandma taught and lived every day. And though I'm sad that Grandma has passed, I can't help but smile, imagining her and Grandpa dancing together again. <laughs> I know that when I heard the news, to confirm it that week. For me personally, my, my consolation was, was the image of that dazzling smile as she saw the face of Jesus. And for this we give thanks. Let us pray. O God, before whom generations rise and pass away, we praise you for all your servants, whom having lived this life in faith, now live with you eternally. Especially today, we thank you for your servant Midge. We praise you for the gift of her life, for so much in her that was good and kind and faithful and the determined grace you gave her to sustain her each and every day. We thank you for her devotion to her family, for that remarkable ability to make each one of them, and indeed all of us, feel as if we had her full attention at any time. We thank you for her service to this community and to our state, and even further, her commitment to the poor and the least of these. We thank you for her quiet faith, that brilliant smile, and her inestimable strength. And so we thank you, Father, that for her death is past and pain has ended, and she has now entered into the joy you have prepared through Jesus Christ, our Lord.
reading first from Psalm 121. Listen now for the word of the Lord. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. You will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over you. Your coming and going, both now and forevermore. If ever there were a woman who understood the fine balance of hardship and joy in this life, it was Midge. So it's only fitting that these verses would be highlighted in her Bible. Reading from Romans 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character and character hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Hardship happens, so does joy. It's God's power that allows the joy to emerge even from the hardship. Still, let's be clear, we don't celebrate the hardship itself. Hardship is bad. And we of faith can boast in our sufferings because we do believe that that hardship, the suffering, produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Suffering happens, and it happens again, and it happens again. We put our faith in God, and put our faith in God again, and we put our faith in God again. We find by faith again and again that God is with us so that in a very real sense, our capacity to stay emotionally, physically, and spiritually strong through struggle can and does increase. Endurance increases, character increases. From suffering, a human experience, to endurance, a human endeavor, to character, a human strength, to hope. Finally, we confess that the future belongs and depends on God. All because God's love, simply and finally, God works for our joy because he loves us. Not because we've earned it or deserve it, but because he loves us, joy is always waiting somewhere on the other side of hardship. And that's really it, isn't it? Midge knew some really hard times, losses I certainly wouldn't want to bear. And yet, is there anyone you have ever met who radiated more joy than Midge? Did anybody embody the good news better than she did? I haven't met. In the second chapter of the book of Acts, Peter stands to defend his faith against outsiders who confuse the work of the Spirit. You remember the passage, it's great. They think everybody's drunk, they're not. Peter uses uh, the words of King David in Psalm 16 to describe the transformation wrought by faith. I saw the Lord always before me, because the Lord is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope. 
because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Now I have a hunch that Midge was made of tougher stuff than most of us. But we can't, and she wouldn't want us to, discount the power of the Holy Spirit that gave her the courage to continue. So that suffering would produce perseverance, and perseverance produce character, and character produce hope, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. So thank you, Midge, Margaret Ann, Mita. I love the fact that her middle name is Greek for great. Wasn't she great? I didn't know that. Her middle name is great. Thank you. Thank you for the time we were allowed to spend with her here on earth. And thank you, God, for the eternity we will spend with her by faith. Thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ and the faith in him which makes such gratitude possible. Midge Cranson. Friend and sister in Christ. Well done. Good and faithful servants. Well done. Let us pray. God of grace and comfort, we lift before you this day all who are grieving. We pray especially for one another, for Gary and Sue, for Jan and Leroy, Nate and Kathy, Annette and Jerry, Greg and Addie, Randy, for their children and their children's children, for family and for friends as dear as family. Lord, help us to believe where we have not seen, trusting you to lead us through our years. Help us to live as those who are prepared to die so that in our living or in our dying, we belong to Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. A louder in silence, let's say together the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand as we sing together, Be Thou My Vision.
Let us pray. O oh Lord, support us all the day long until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed and the fever of life is over and our work is done. Then in your mercy, grant us a safe lodging and a holy rest and peace at the last. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. And now, into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant and child of the covenant, Margaret Ann. Acknowledge, we pray, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy and into the blessed rest of everlasting, everlasting peace and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you, and give you peace everlasting. Amen. Did you? Yeah, you. <laughs> I think we have one. Come on. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Please be seated. I feel that in my bones. I feel like there's a word that 
I need to speak, and this is really challenging me for, for me because I am also not just the daughter of Mitch, my mom. I'm also the son, I'm not the daughter, the son, oh, there we go. I am the son of Walter. And I remember many, many times growing up and my dad would stand up and do something like I'm doing right now, yeah. going against the status quo. Oh, saying something that's not on the program. And I worked my whole life to get with the program. And there's a program that is given to us by the Spirit of God, who moves us every moment to speak a word when he tells us to speak it. And I have failed so many times. My son preached a sermon about my mom last week at his church in Montrose. And he said, the title of it was, that, Let There Be No Regrets. I would be walking out of this church today in regret that I didn't stand up and speak what I need to speak right now, even though I'm facing my own doubts and fears about showing up. So I am learning to break this curse that's been on my life that says, you're not good enough. You are the eighth child of a family of nine. And I had a belief in my life that, and I'm wrestling with it still, right in the back pew, that says, everything's already been said that needs to be said. And I felt that a lot of times in our family meetings, everything's already been said. And when I say something, they, there's this uh, word that comes, sit down and shut up. <laughs> It doesn't matter what you say. But I'm learning that it matters what I say. When I'm prompted by the Spirit of God to say something, stand up and say it, no matter what, how much my conscience or my old man beats me up afterward and says, that was really stupid, Greg. You really made a fool out of yourself that time. And so I'm going through this battle. But there's one story I want to share that I felt prompted to share this day about my mother. When we came last week to share, uh, to share time in the home and have a memorial service with my family and whoever else, there was something on my mother's wall in her home, a plaque that had the commandments of God and the Our Father. And my, I see that is a word that was given from heaven to us on earth. The prayer of Jesus Christ who said, Our Father, it's Our Father. And my mom was rooted and grounded, just like I appreciate this tree, this picture of this tree planted and it's growing. And the word of God says, we are trees of righteousness, planted of the Lord. And I remember my mom, and then this scripture came to mind in Jeremiah, chapter 17, somewhere. It says, cursed is, the man who believe, who, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes his arm the flesh because he will be growing in, like in a desert place, a shrub in the desert, and he will not see when help comes. So many times I don't see where help is coming from because I'm so looking at my own flesh. And then I was remembering the other part of the verse, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, who makes the Lord his strength. And I couldn't remember the rest, and I said, I remember my mom telling me a few weeks ago, you know what, I'm so blessed. Look at all the pastors that are in this family. So I'm gonna put you pastors and their wives, because sometimes they know more than the, than the husbands, the pastors. 
So I'm going to put you on the test, okay? Tell me the rest of the verse. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, for he shall be like a tree. Yeah? Planted by the waters. My mom was a tree. Planted in the roots. It went down into the, into the soil. It was grounded in the word of God. And the one word of God that I know my mom and my dad heard, and I've said it before. <clears throat> when God planted the word in the beginning, he said, all right after he created man, he spoke a word and he said, be fruitful <laughs> and multiply. And my mom heard that word and my dad heard that word and they were living it, they were planted. They planted the whole heritage of the word of God. There's one more story I want to I want to share and then I'm I'm done. My mom I had an experience with my mom where I was under the curse when I was a teenager and I was going to the flesh and trying to feed myself and be filled with the flesh so I had overeaten another awesome meal. I loved to eat. And I was trying to fill that place in me that feels empty a lot of times. So I had eaten a big meal as usual and I was laying in bed. And my stomach was in excruciating pain. And I was laying there and I was in the next room. My mom was in the next room and my dad. <clears throat> and I was, I was like, ah, and I was starting to groan. And pretty soon, here comes my mom. This is the middle of the night. My mom comes in. And with that, those same hands that God created, the same hands that sat in this pew for years, the same hands that I grew up with sitting in the old Presbyterian church downtown with those old ancient wooden pews. And I remember my hard dress shoes that I had a hard time putting on and finding the socks for. They clonk, they were clanking on the pew, sitting next to my mom, waiting for the boring sermon. In my mind, it was like, but they were clanking on the pew, and my mom would reach out with her hand. And she would lay it on my shoulder and say, peace. And there was peace. So that same hand that raised her head in this congregation so far, for so many years and worshiped the living God, those same hands came walking into that room where I was lying in pain and only as a mother's hand can do. In such a simple moment, she came in and she laid her hands on my stomach. And I knew those hands were already weary from toil of the day, from scrubbing floors. Sounds like that was the last thing she did in the day that she passed. She was scrubbing the floor, serving. Those same hands that were worn and she had worked all day in the middle of the night and they were weary, she came in and she laid her hand on my stomach. And immediately, the pain was gone. It wasn't taking aspirin, wasn't running to the cupboard. It was like she came in and she laid her hand on my stomach and the pain was gone and there was peace. And I praise God for my mom's faithfulness to keep laying her hands on all of her grandchildren. and not stopping till the day she died. To be a witness of the gift of God, that, she, that the, the word of God that was planted in her, she gave it, she shared it, she lived it. And we have that precious gift planted here because we're the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he would be glorified. So thank you. God, for the gift of your word, for the gift of your commandments, and for the way in Jesus Christ that we have to walk 
in the grace of God that saves us from the curse. So I am overcoming the curse. This is a witness. Me standing up here is a breaking off of the curse that would hold me in bondage to say, sit down and shut up, Greg. What you have to say is not worth anything. It's already been said. You have no value here. And what Nathan said in his ser sermon, start showing up. Don't let the curse pull you down. We are here to be overcomers. And we overcome by the blood of the Lamb, his work, and the word of our testimony. This is my testimony to you. My mom followed the word of God, and she lived it, and it is living in each one of you. So blessed to see this heritage. All these pastors, all these wives, all these people that are speaking the word. We need it in this world. We so need the word of God, the truth of God. So thank God I can walk out of this church and hear those voices still going, oh, that was stupid, Greg, whatever. And I can say, thank you, God, for the grace. It's not about me. It's about a living God who gave us a plan and a purpose to walk through this world that is so fearful and so broken and so divided right now and bring a touch that my mom exemplified to me and actually witnessed. I felt it, the hand of a mother on her children that brings life. Thank you so much for having this space and allowing me to share. Amen. <laughs> Lunch is downstairs. There is a sandwich bar outside the window of the kitchen. You've all been down there. And then there are tables set out on the lawn or in the Fellowship Hall. Take as much time as you need. Go in peace. Thank you.